Hello and welcome to Sophie & Co. I'm Sophie Shevardnadze. In today's volatile world, uh, the mercenary business is booming. Despite their murky legal status, soldiers of fortune are in demand and the pay is high. But is it all about the money? And do those who fight wars for cash even care about which side they're on? Well, we ask Simon Mann, an elite British SAS officer turned mercenary who got paid to fight conflicts in Africa, but it ended up costing him his freedom. He's our guest today. Soldiers of fortune, dogs of war. For some, they're knights in shining armor, coming to save the day when governments fail. For others, they're bloodhounds, thirsty for cash, ready to kill for the highest bidder. Where does the truth lie? Can mercenaries make the world safer, or are they just pawns in a game of power? So we have Simon Mann in the studio, ex-British military officer, also a former mercenary. Simon, it's really great to have you with us today. You were serving in elite royal troops. You were taking orders from the Queen. And how hard was it afterwards to sell your services to the higher bidder? Well, it wasn't really like that because, first of all, I was never senior enough for the Queen to actually tell me personally what to do. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was a captain in the Scots Guards. And uh, the Scots Guards obviously has the privilege of guarding the Queen. And then when I became a mercenary, you know, we actually started, we got involved in this because we were attacked uh, in Angola. And so we, we sided with the government and fought back. So for me, that wasn't um, that hard a transition to make at all because I found myself actually in the Angolan army. I was, I was signed up in the Angolan <coughs> army. And in fact, I had the rank of brigadier general in the Angolan army. So a lot of things were, 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 were not so different. But how much, how much of it was about the money, though? Because pri private military company does imply selling your skills and services for money. And you weren't really doing it for, for pro bono. No, that's true. Um, but at, what I'm saying is that at the beginning, when we, you asked me how I started, how I became a mercenary, and, and that was how. Um, later, we, we established executive outcomes, and money became much more of an issue. And yes, it was primarily for, for, for money that we were operating. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just trying to uh, imagine for myself, I mean, how hard is it to justify things you fight for when the war that you are fighting has nothing to do with your family, your men, your countrymen? Um, I, I didn't find it difficult. Uh, you know, I've been a professional soldier in the British Army for 12 years, and um, we were asked to do things, and expected to do things that were, were not necessarily how we saw the world and not necessarily what we wanted to do. So to then find myself um, protecting my old company in the first instance and then making money in Angola, which was a country I really liked, uh, was fine. And then to find myself in Sierra Leone fighting really ghastly rebels who were committing terrible atrocities was also fine. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I just wonder, why did you leave the British Army in the first place? I mean, you know, you guys are paid to, to, to fight for good causes. I mean, British Army certainly positions itself uh, to be at the rescue of democracies in crisis. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I actually joined. In fact, I was asked to stay on in the British Army um, that time, and I was asked to do another job with my regiment, which was then the Special Air Service, or, or had been the Special Air Service. Um, and I was very tempted to do that job. But my friend, who was the owner and chief executive of Heritage Oil and Gas, said, come on, Simon, it's time you made some real money. You've got kids, etc., etc. Join my oil company. So my new career was as an oil man. It was accidental that we then became what we did become, which was you know, the number one private military company in Africa. So is the manufacturer the main difference between your work as a mercenary uh, and uh, between being an officer in British Special Forces? Uh, um, I would actually say no, um, because when you find yourself um, in wars 
purely for money or mainly for money, then um, there are a lot of things which become extremely difficult, um, which, which are issues, which are problems, which you do not have if you are um, in, a, in a normal you know, sovereign state military force. So what, what issues are those? Well, for example, um, you might find yourself having to make a decision as to whether we have three helicopters in an operational theatre or two. Now, if it's three, that's the cost of that helicopter and operating it coming straight out of your pocket if you're one of the owners of that company. Now, you know you could probably get away with two, but the lack of that third is very likely to lead to, um, you know, quite probably the death of uh, one of your, your soldiers. So what you, what you end up having to do is make um, financial, business-like decisions with, with, on the other end of the scale, instead of a normal sort of business decision where is it a good idea to invest this money or not, it's like people's lives. And that is hard, and that is not something you have to do in, in a regular army. Those decisions are basically being taken for you in a regular army, and you just have to make the most of, most of it and get on with your orders. Huh, so it's just easier to obey orders than to make your own decisions? Uh, well, making your own decisions when you're having to make that kind of decision is, is tough. Because obviously, you know, you, you're there, you're, make, you're making money, but you don't, so you, you, you're, you're playing a balance about are we going to be utterly ruthless with the lives of our men? and boost the profit, or what? But Simon, did you actually, did you, did you actually fight uh, with the gun in your hand? Were you in the front lines, or was it just a logistical work? Um, I, I was shot at um, on a number of occasions. I was armed, um, but I never actually got into the position where I had to shoot back. I mean, I was a fairly sort of senior officer. I'm asking because Sierra Leone is known to have children soldiers uh, in the ranks of their rebels. I was wondering if you've ever come across kids with the guns. What is it like facing your enemy, but there are kids with the guns? Yeah, I mean, like um, in Sierra Leone, I never got that close to the fighting when there were um, child soldiers involved. Um, but these child soldiers um, were. I mean, they were very often on drugs, and the, the atrocities that were being committed by them were, were dreadful. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, um, I mean, I'm just assuming that, like, um, a European bred man, when he sees a child soldier, even if that child soldier is on drugs, probably has a moral dilemma whether to shoot at him or not. Yeah, I was never, I'm glad to say, in that position, but I guess some of the guys were. Um, what happened there? That did, must have did, been pretty tough for them. Did, did you guys ever talk about it? Did any of your um, colleagues tell you about this? No, no, because you know very often the fighting is not sort of not not um, in direct sight of the enemy. It's a, a case of there's incoming fire and you're firing back. You can't even really tell whether they're children or whether they're adults. Um, the bullets are coming towards you either way. So, um, for those who are actually fighting on the front lines, they consider these child rebels to be a full-fledged soldiers and full-fledged enemy, right? Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. but do you know uh, how many civilians have suffered during your operations, if any? Well, I mean, there was dreadful suffering going on by a very large number of civilians. No question. And uh, our objective was to end those wars, both of them as quickly as possible. But during um, that operation, the, during the operation itself? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many civilians have um, suffered no, I mean, during the operation? So, what, how many civilians we might have killed accidentally or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes. No, no. and in fact, one of, the, one of the things that Executive Outcomes is, is very proud of is that in both of those wars, in Angola and Sierra Leone, there was never one single um, charge made against us that there had been any kind of atrocity um, committed by us. Now, that's actually a track record which I think most regular armies would be jealous of.
Mm -hmm. But so when you were talking to local people um, outside the operation, did they treat you as liberators or, or, or enemies? They treat us as, as liberators, absolutely. No, in fact, on one occasion, um, I was actually approached by the mayor of a town in Sierra Leone, a place called Koidu, by the mayor and his senior councillors, who had a bag of money that they gave me, or tried to give me, because they had heard that we were withdrawing from that, um, that particular place on the orders of the government. And it amazed me that here were these extremely tough uh, South African soldiers with a pretty ferocious uh, reputation. And here were these local people begging us to stay. <laughs> um, Simon, we're going to take a short break now. And uh, right after, we'll be back with the mercenary Simon Mann to talk about African prisons and how toppling foreign governments help spread democracy around the world. So stay with us. News, reviews, economic ups and downs from the finance hub of Moscow to London, New York, Shanghai and the rest of the globe. Join me, Katie Pilbeam, every week on RT. Join me on Boom Bus for in-depth, impartial, and en vogue financial reporting, commentary, interviews, and much, much more. Only on Boom Bus and only on RT. We are not talking the language of war, but I will only react to situations. I have read the reports, but uh, I'm not in a position to... No, I will leave that to the State Department to comment on your latter point. I don't want to say that, yeah. Hey, Mr. K, you have any comments on the docket? Uh, no. no comment? Yeah, we got no comment. Thank you. No more weasel words. When you evade a direct question, be prepared for a chase. When you throw a punch, be ready for a battle. Freedom of speech means little without the freedom to question. Right from the scene. First-rate news and eye-gripping pictures. On our reporters' Twitter and Instagram. To be in the know, follow us. And we're back with Simon Mann, ex-British SAS officer and also a former mercenary. So Simon, did you ever witness anything you'd like to forget? during your time in Africa? You know, I, I, I don't like seeing the results of fighting. Um, and I don't think uh, any soldier does. Um, it's always shocking. And um, it stays with you. 
and you wish it, it wasn't happening. But what was it exactly? Was it something particular to those operations or to Africa? Because, I mean, obviously no one likes to play the war. But was it something so dreadful about those operations in Africa that you would like to forget? Uh, yeah, there was a um, there was a village in um, Sierra Leone where where we got we got there after the RUF, who were the guerrilla force, had pulled out, and um, there were bits of body all over the all over the village. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a pretty sight. Hmm. Was it even worse than what you saw or experienced in the African prisons that you were put in? for a short period of time. Yeah, well, as, as you know, I was in prison for five and a half years in total, four years in Zimbabwe and 18 months in Equatorial Guinea. Notorious prison and, in Equatorial um, Guinea. I mean, that was very... I mean, no one wants to be held in that yeah, prison. 18, uh, that was called Black Beach. Although, actually, I think, I don't know, I was in solitary confinement in, in Black Beach all the time. Um, and so I didn't see a lot of the stuff that was going on outside my cell. But how did they Whereas treat you Zimbabwe, there? in Zimbabwe, I was in the... Um, well, in the end, they treated me well. I'd, I'd managed to help them. Um, and uh, I had a long interrogation and a long trial. And in the course of that, um, we, you know, we, we got along better and better as time went on. But it was, um, it was tough because I was um, in solitary confinement. And for the first uh, three months, I was in um, handcuffs and leg irons all the time. And uh, the climate there is pretty vicious. I mean, it's really, really hot and sticky with a lot of mosquitoes, no mosquito net, no ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, was quite, um, it was quite testing. What about Zimbabwe prison? Well, that was a very different experience because there I was with uh, general prisoners, um, very overcrowded prison and, um, you know, a rough place. But how is it for a foreigner to be in an African prison with everyone else? Did they treat you better or worse because you were a foreigner? Well, African culture is extremely um, friendly, especially to foreigners. And their whole instinct is actually to look after you, and uh, and I was looked after. Huh. So I get. I guess you got lucky there at least. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm mean, surely you knew that the things you were doing, and I mean fighting a mercenary war, was illegal, um, and you were most likely to end up in jail. Were you prepared for the consequences? I, I was. Yes. Obviously, I had to be. I mean, I couldn't possibly have set out to do what we set out to try and do, which was to overthrow the government of Equatorial Guinea, had I not been aware that if things went wrong, I would have been thrown into prison. I was very aware of it. Um, so far as I was concerned, it was just a part of the equation. It was a part of the risk that we were running. So the money was really good enough for that risk to be taken? Uh, well, I actually lost a whole lot of money, in fact. I mean, in reality, <laughs> um, I wasn't paid anything to do the Equatorial Guinea exercise. Um, had it all been successful, then I would have been paid a lot of money, but only after a long chain of um, ifs, you know, if we'd been successful, if the person we'd backed had ultimately been elected, um, if his cabinet decided to honour the agreements he'd made, et cetera, et cetera. So it was by no means something you'd want to take your bank manager. But can I ask you something? When you sign up, or when, when you used to sign up for this kind of things, were your interests uh, somehow insured, protected, or you were just sent out there in an open war field and whatever happens, happens, there's no guarantee? I uh, know, you, you know, you have to accept if you do anything like this, even if you know or if you suspect that friendly governments are in favour of the operation, you must realise that if it goes wrong, you are going to be on your own. And if you're flying around Africa as a white mercenary, then they're going to throw away the key if you're lucky. Um, if you're not lucky, they're going to chop you up and eat you.
Hmm. But you, I know that you expressed remorse on your part about wanting to overthrow the president of Equatorial Guinea. Did you just say that to get you out of jail? I mean, because the man isn't, you know, world's most benevolent leader, right? He is a dictator who's been there for the last 35 years. Sure. Sure. Uh, well, like I said before, while, while I was in prison in Equatorial Guinea, in the course of my interrogation and my trial, um, we found common ground. Um, basically, his enemies were, in fact, by that stage, mine, because my erstwhile colleagues, the people who'd set me up in the operation, um, complete, completely failed to back me up to, they, did, they, made, they did nothing to help the men, my men, or the men's families who were deserted and without support down in South Africa. And of course, you know, they were desperate and I was in really big trouble because I was in a prison with 70 guys who I'd led in there. And when they discovered that nothing was being done to help their families, that didn't make my position in that prison any easier. Um, so, so it was a genuine regret and genuine remorse. In the end, I had common remorse. ground with Equatorial Guinea. It was, uh, and it still is. I mean, we shouldn't have done it. We, you know, we, we were trying to do something that was wrong, um, and uh, I regretted it. But what was wrong about it? To meddle in foreign countries' affairs, or it was wrong because you, you realized that the, the dictator guy was a good guy? No, it was wrong because we, we caused so much suffering um, amongst a lot of people. Um, and you know, we were trying to act in a very arbitrary way. And we didn't really know, as it turned out, what the situation in Equatorial Guinea was. We thought we did, but uh, in reality, Equatorial Guinea, although it still has a very bad reputation, in reality, it is now um, headed in the right direction. They're working very hard to you know, bring their human rights and their um, social uh, system up to you know, a better standard. So now that you've experienced African politics firsthand, how pervasive was the outside influence? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, Angola was the worst war of the, uh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Angola was the worst proxy war of the whole Cold War. There were Russian troops there, there were Cuban troops there uh, on one side, and there were American and South African troops there on the other. Now, the whole peace plan was all about getting those foreign troops out. And that was the situation that we found ourselves in when we were attacked. Um, and the foreign influence was massive. There's no question. Um, and I would go so far as to say that when UNITA went back to war illegally, they were probably pushed back to war by various interests, notably the South Africans. Wow. Um, Sierra Leone was a completely, completely different um, animal in that the, I don't think there was, I don't think anyone even really knew or cared what was happening in Sierra Leone, which in, in itself is as, as bad or worse. But also I know that you were asked to help start the Iraq war. What was that all about? And just how close are governments and intelligence services with mercenary soldiers? Well, I wasn't, um, I wasn't paid. <laughs> <laughs> for that, um, so I, I, I would I would argue that that wasn't a mercenary thing. It was a it was a very strange thing. I was involved with a, a guy who is now actually um, sadly dead, called David Hart, who was a remarkable character. Um, was close to Lady Thatcher at one time, and he was writing papers that were going to straight to Tony Blair, and this was in the. Um, this was in the run-up to the Iraq invasion. So I guess this was in 2002, before the decisions had really been made. And he needed help to write these papers because he himself had no military service. So I said to him, well, why do you want, to have, why do you want, why do you want me to help you? There are loads of people who can help you. And he said, oh, well, you, know, you were in the SAS. And I said, look, David, you know, there are 100 people within a mile of here. 
and we were having lunch in the, in the Ritz, actually. And I said, there are 100 people within a mile of here who, who were also in the SCS and who are better qualified than me. And he said, ah, but they haven't fought and won two private, uh, two private wars, i.e. Angola and Sierra Leone. So I did help him, and um, I helped him by writing papers of my own, which he then used in his papers, as to how and uh, the hows and the, and the wherefores of the, uh, the Iraq war. Can I ask you something? Would you, uh, if you were uh, right now offered a contract to topple Bashar al-Assad, would you go for it? I would absolutely not go for that. No, I think that situation is so horrific and so complex. Uh, no, that would be a no. I must be getting older. Uh -huh. But also, th these are your words. Toppling foreign governments is what democracy is all about. Do you still think so? Well, democracy is about changing governments, but it's, it's about changing governments in a legal and hopefully non-military, non-violent way. Um, we don't know, see much of that going there. on lately. I mean, we're... <laughs> well, well, where are you talking about? Well, look, Iraq, Libya, once again, what they're trying to do in Syria, you know, we can also talk about all these countries in Arab Spring, but it's going to take us to a whole new subject. But um, in general, you know, toppling governments for democracy's sake uh, doesn't usually bring democracy nowadays, because those countries where the governments were changed aren't really much better off than they were before. Yeah, I mean, you're opening a very big subject here, aren't you? And in fact, I, I, I'm on Twitter and I, I have tweeted about this quite a few times. And I've actually said, if you look at revolutions, um, the French, the British, the Russian, they're almost invariably followed by periods of great unrest. For, for a revolution to go straight from being a violent upset of the existing order to being a well-run democracy is impossible. It just won't happen. Because the, the act of the revolution is so violent that there are, the, the aftershocks are so great that there is a period of chaos. Simon, thank you so much for this interesting insight. Uh, in your life and mercenary work. We were talking to Simon Mann, ex-British SAS officer and former mercenary who was talking about his life experience during his uh, operations as mercenary in Africa. That's it for this edition of Sophie & Co. And we will see you next time. Thank you.